I'm going to read the Braiding Sweetgrass chapter on Wendigo Footprints. Um, skip the introduction, but get to the meat of the chapter. The Wendigo is the legendary monster of our Anishinaabe people, the villain of a tale told on freezing nights in the North Woods. You can feel it lurking behind you, a being in the shape of an outsized man, ten feet tall, with frost-white hair hanging from its shaking body. With arms like tree trunks, feet as big as snowshoes, it travels easily through the blizzards of the hungry time, stalking us. The hideous stench of its carrion breath poisons the clean scent of snow as it pants behind us. Yellow fangs hang from its mouth that is raw where it has chewed off its lips from hunger. Most telling of all, its heart is made of ice. Wendigo stories were told around the fire to scare children into safe behavior lest this Ojibwe boogeyman make a meal of them. Or worse, this monster is no bear or howling wolf, no natural beast. Wendigos are not born, they are made. The Wendigo is a human being who has become a cannibal monster. Its bite will transform victims into cannibals too. It wasn't always... When I come in from the rising blizzard and peel off my ice-coated clothes, there's a fire in the wood stove and a simmering pot of stew. It wasn't always that way for our people. When the storms would bury the lodges and the food was gone, they named this time the Hunger Moon. The snow is too deep, the deer are gone, and the caches are empty. It's the time when an elder leaves to hunt and never returns. When sucking a bone is not enough, the infants follow. After too many days, desperation is the only soup. Starvation in winter was a reality for our people, particularly in the era of the Little Ice Age, when winters were especially hard and long. Windigo mythology also spread quickly in the time of the fur trade, when ex over-exploration of game brought famine to the villages. The ever-present fear of winter famine is embodied in the icy hunger and gaping maw of the Windigo. As the monster shrieked on the wind, the Wendigo stories reinforced the taboo against cannibalism, when the madness of hunger and isolation rustled at the edge of the winter lodges. Succumbing to such a repulsive urge doomed the gnar of bones to wander as a Wendigo for the rest of time. It is said that the Wendigo will never enter the spirit world, but will suffer the eternal pain of need, its essence a hunger that will never be sated. The more a Wendigo eats, the more ravenous it becomes. It shrieks with its craving, its mind a torture of unmet want. Consumed by consumption, it lays waste to humankind. It's more than just a mythic monster intended to frighten children. It's a world, it's a glimpse into the worldview of people, how they understand themselves, their place in the world, and the ideals to which they aspire. Likewise, well, that's the creation stories. Likewise, the collective fears and deepest values of a people are also seen in the visage of the monsters they create, born of our fears and our failings. Wendigo is the name for that within us that cares more for its own survival than anything else. It's a case study of a positive feedback loop in which a change in one entity promotes a similar change in another, connected part of the system. Um, in this case, an increase in Wendigo hunger causes an increase in Wendigo eating, and that only promotes a rampant hunger and an, eventually, an eventual frenzy of uncontrolled consumption. In the natural world, as well as the built environment, positive feedback leads inexorably to change, sometimes to growth, sometimes to destruction. When growth is unbalanced, however, you can't always tell the difference. Stable, balanced systems are typified by negative feedback loops in which a change in one component incites an opposite change in another, so they balance each other out. When hunger causes increased eating, eating causes decreased hunger. Sati satiation is possible. Negative feedback is a form of reciprocity, a, couple of, a coupling of forces that creates balance and sustainability. I just want to finish this. Six more minutes. Wendigo stories sought to encourage negative feedback loops in the mind of listeners 
Traditional upbringing was designed to strengthen self-discipline, to build resistance against the insidious germ of taking too much. The old teachings recognize that Wendigo nature is in each of us. So the monster was created in stories that we might learn why we should recoil from the greedy part of ourselves. It reminds us to always acknowledge the two faces, the light and the dark side of life, in order to understand ourselves. See the dark, recognize its power, but do not feed it. See the dark, recognize its power, but do not feed it. The beast has been called an evil spirit that devours mankind. The very word Wendigo, according to Ojibwe scholar Basil Johnston, can be derived from root meaning fat excess or thinking only of oneself. <laughs> Wendigo is a human whose selfishness has overpowered their self-control to the point that satisfaction is no longer possible. No matter what they call it, Let's point to the current epidemic of self-destructive practices. Addiction to alcohol, drugs, gambling, technology, screens, and more. As a sign that Wendigo is alive and well. Any overindulgent habit is self-destructive, and self-destruction is Wendigo. And just as Wendigo's bite is infectious, we all know too well that self-destruction drags along many more victims. Aww in our human families as well as in the more than human world. The native habitat of the Wendigo is the Northwoods, but the range has expanded in the last few centuries. Multinational corporations have spawned a new breed of Wendigo that insatiably devours the Earth's resources, not for greed, uh, not for need, but for greed. The footprints are all around us, once you know what to look for. Let me skip a little bit. Of, uh... Cautionary Wendigo tales arose in a common space society where sharing was essential to survival and greed made in any individual a danger to the whole. In the old times, individuals who endangered the community by taking too much for themselves were first counseled, then ostracized, and if the greed continued, they were eventually banished. The Wendigo myth may have arisen from the remembrance of the banished, doomed to wander hungry and alone, wreaking vengeance on the ones who spurned them. It's a terrible punishment to be banished from the web of reciprocity with no one to share with you and no one for you to care for. Maybe we've all been banished to lonely corners by our obsession with private property. We've accepted banishment even from ourselves when we spend our beautiful, utterly singular lives on making more money, to buy more things that feed but never satisfy. It's the Wendigo way that tricks us into believing that belongings will fill our hunger when it is belonging that we crave. On a grander scale, too, we seem to be living in an era of Wendigo economics, of fabricated demand and compulsive overconsumption. What Native people once sought to rein in, we are now asked to unleash in a systemic policy of sanctioned greed. The fear for me is far greater than just acknowledging the wind to go within. The fear for me is that the world has been turned inside out, the dark side made to seem light. Indulgent self-interest that our people once held to be monstrous is now celebrated as success. We are asked to admire what our people viewed as unforgivable. The consumption-driven mindset masquerades as quality of life, but eats us from within. It is as if we've been invited to a feast, but the table is laid with food that nourishes only emptiness, the black hole of the stomach that never fills. We have unleashed a monster. Ecological eco economists argue for reforms that would ground economics in ecological principles and the constraints of thermodynamics. They urge the embrace of the radical notion that we must sustain natural capital and ecosystem services if we are to maintain quality of life. But governments still cling to the neoclassical fallacy that human consumption has no consequences. We continue to embrace economic systems that prescribe infinite growth on a finite planet, as if somehow the universe had repealed the laws of thermodynamics on our behalf. Perpetual growth is simply not compatible with natural law, and yet a leading economist, Lawrence Summers from the World Bank and the U.S. National Economic Council, issues such statements such as, 
There are no limits to the carrying capacity of the earth that are likely to bind at any time in the foreseeable future. The idea that we should put limits on growth because of some natural limit is a profound error. Our leaders willfully ignore the wisdom and the models of every other species on the planet, except, of course, those that have gone extinct. This is Wendigo thinking. 